Today we're going to be brewing up a Dark Mild, which is a beer style that you almost never find outside of the homebrew community. It is a almost forgotten English style of beer that is actually really one of the coolest types of beer that you might be able to find across the pond. This is a beer style that is very low ABV, usually 4% or less, uh, and has a ton of flavor in it for such a low alcohol beer. It's something that was a lot more popular in England about you know three or four decades ago, uh, but has kind of since dropped off in popularity. Homebrewers have done a fantastic job of keeping the style alive, and I was actually able to uh, find a version while I was overseas in London uh, a couple years ago. It was actually really, really nice. But it's a style of beer that gets easily overshadowed by IPAs and Pilsners and all the other stuff that people readily want to drink and want to brew nowadays in our modern age. Well, because I'm kind of focusing a bit more on English beers this year, this is something I wanted to make. And uh, lo and behold, the same guy who sent me that pile of Admiral Maltings for the English IPA uh, actually sent me enough to brew a second beer with it. And I'm going to be using it to brew this dark mild with. I absolutely love the way the Admiral Malts came across in the English IPA, so I'm really excited to see what they do in this beer as well. Bottom line though, if you're a big fan of low alcohol beers, this is absolutely a video for you to watch. Before we jump into the recipe, I want to give a big shout out to a couple organizations for helping make it possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, where you can find most of the ingredients for this batch of beer. I don't think they stock Admiral Malts, but uh, when I'm talking about the actual grist, I will make sure I give some sort of substitute for the malts that I'm going to be talking about there. Uh, secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they make the system that I'll be brewing this beer on. This is the 10 gallon 240 volt system. So we're gonna be starting out with five and a half pounds of Admiral Maltings Maiden Voyage. Uh, if you can't find this particular malt, I would recommend just going with plain old Maris Otter, uh, but this is going to be a very similar pale ale style malt. We're gonna to add to that three quarters of a pound of Admiral Maltings Kilnsmith. Uh, Kilnsmith is kind of like a low degree caramel malt. Um, not quite a caramel malt, but also somewhat similar to a Munich malt in the way that it's made. If you can't find this particular malt, I'd recommend looking for Best Malt's Red X. Uh, and then we're going to add for a little bit of body contribution to this one, uh, which is actually quite needed in a very low ABV beer. Uh, three quarters of a pound of malted oats. So this is going to add a little bit of body, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of fullness to the beer. Uh, and then on top of that, we'll add four ounces, quarter pound, of dark crystal malt from Simpsons. This is going to give us a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of a kind of a caramel note as well. Should be pretty good. And then on top of that, to make this dark mild to dark mild, we're gonna add two different roasted malts to it. Uh, three ounces of Carafa Special 2, which is gonna help us dial in our color, and then three ounces of pale chocolate malt, which is gonna give us um, a little hint of a roasty character in there, a little bit, just a, just a kiss of it. Um, and then also, I think, if we do this right, it should give us a nice nutty flavor. For the hops in this beer, it's not particularly hoppy. Um, this is really a malt forward style, but we're gonna go ahead and still use some traditional English hops in it. Uh, going for about 30 IBUs in here, 31 IBUs actually, um, of East Kent Goldings. So starting out with one ounce, at 60 minutes for about 20 IBUs, and then one ounce at 20 minutes for a little bit of that flavor contribution, uh, and that'll be about 12 IBUs. For the yeast in this beer, wasn't really happy with the way the SO4 presented uh, in the English IPA, so I'm gonna not use that particular yeast strain. I'm gonna go with a tried and true, standard, clean, well-performing ale yeast, and that is going to be Wildman Nottingham. This yeast is not gonna mess around, and if I do things properly with it, it will be clean as a whistle, and should allow those nice malt flavors to really shine. For the water profile in this beer, uh, we're actually gonna be going for a relatively high amount of minerals. Uh, this is pretty standard in English brewing, uh, but there is a relatively high sulfate to chloride ratio on this one. Um, the reason being is because we're kind of playing with different parts of the balance of this beer in different ways. I'm tugging on the maltiness with some of the grist choices that I've made. I'm tugging on the hoppiness with the higher level of IBUs that I made. And then we also want this beer to be a little bit of a drier finish uh, in the mouth while still retaining body. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. We're going to be using a high sulfate to chloride ratio to help emphasize the dry finish on this one. That should not impact the body and the other decisions that we are making to increase the body of the beer to keep this less than 4% ABV beer still feeling like a full-sized beer. So, the water profile we're going to be doing is 101 parts per million of calcium, 17 parts per million of magnesium, 49 parts per million of sodium, 105 parts per million of chloride, 197 parts per million of sulfate, and 88 parts per million of bicarbonate. 
In order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of reverse osmosis water, and I'll be adding to that three grams of baking soda, five grams of calcium chloride, one gram of canning salt or sodium chloride, five grams of Epsom salt, and seven grams of gypsum. This is a pretty wild water profile addition here, but uh, I've done it before for several other beers, and sometimes it actually works really, really well. For the mash in this beer, we're gonna be mashing this one at 155 degrees for a single infusion mash. That's a high temperature for a single infusion mash, but with a beer that is this low in ABV, sometimes that choice actually works really well. So I want to balance the drinkability of the beer with its body, and I also want to ensure we have enough residual sugar left over after Nottingham, which is a relatively high attenuating yeast, uh, can go through everything. So by having that higher mash temperature, I think we're going to get that effect. Anyway guys, I'm really excited to jump into this beer style, uh, something I've never done before, so it'll be really, really fun to see what happens. I started out by adding 8 gallons of reverse osmosis water to my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply electric system, and started to heat that up to the target mash temperature of 155. As I was doing this, I milled out all of my grain, and I also measured out my water salts and added those into the strike water as it was heating up. Once I reached my target temperature, I mashed in with the entire grain bill and stirred it up thoroughly, let it rest for a little bit, and then took a pH measurement to find it um, a little bit high but still acceptable at 5.55. As soon as I confirmed the pH, I let it recirculate for a little bit and then shut off the pump and left the temperature set to 155 and let it rest overnight. Uh, and then I came back the next morning, about 10 to 12 hours later, and continued to brew. So at this point, I pulled out the grain basket, I let it drain for about 15 minutes or so and heated up to a temperature slightly below boiling. Once the grain basket was finished draining, I continued to raise the temperature all the way up to a full on boil. And once I hit the boil, I added in my bittering addition, which was my one ounce of East Kent Goldings going in at 60 minutes. I let the boil continue for another 40 minutes before adding in one more ounce of East Kent Goldings at 20 minutes. And then 10 minutes later, I added in uh, a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and then I did a quick whirlpool just to make sure all of the true piled up in the center of the kettle. As soon as that whirlpool was complete, I chilled in a single pass through my counterflow chiller into my Spike CF5, got us down to a really nice pitching temperature of about 65 degrees, and I measured my OG, found it to be exactly on target at 1037, and then I pitched my single packet of Nottingham Ale yeast and left it to ferment. fermentation on this beer, I'm choosing to use Lalaman Nottingham, and I'll be fermenting it nice and low at about 65 degrees. Although this is an English yeast, this is a very clean English yeast. It's almost lager-like in the way that it ferments so clean. And especially if you ferment it on the lower end of the scale, it's going to be super clean. Really, I'm only using this yeast out of authenticity because it's English, right? I could use any other clean fermenting ale yeast and probably get a very, very similar result. That being said, English yeasts do leave a little bit of a different mouthfeel, I feel, in my experience. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I want to still stick with that particular kind of yeast. You could use any other clean fermenting English ale yeast, and if your heart desires and you want to add some estuary character to the beer, then go ahead and by all means use a different strain. Uh, there's many, many different sub-varieties of English yeasts out there, and they all do very different things. So if you're using like the Whitbread strain, which is like SO4, you're gonna get a decent amount of kind of fruity character with a little bit of uh, diacetyl in there sometimes if you're not careful. If you're using the Timothy Taylor strain, which is one of my favorites, uh, that's why yeast 1469, uh, that's gonna give you loads of like peach and stone fruit and like really intense character. Similar things will happen if you use like a London Ale 3 strain, which is a very popular hazy IPA strain. You're gonna get loads of that tropical fruit if you ferment it at higher uh, temperatures, or you will get a relatively cleaner character if you ferment it on the lower end of the scale. On the other hand though, you can use something like Y-East 1968, the Fuller strain, the London ESB strain. Uh, this is going to really push the maltiness really very forward, uh, but it's also not gonna ferment as much of the complex sugar as something like Nottingham will. And then if you want to take that scale up even more, the Windsor strain is going to ferment even less of that complex sugar and leave you with a very sweet and full feeling beer. There's a number of different ways you can make this particular beer style. What I'm trying to say here is just because I'm using Nottingham doesn't mean that you should. You can use any of these yeasts and get a very different mild in the process. 
If you want to use Kvike in a beer, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it just because of authenticity. However, uh, Lutra or Voss, I think would do decently in this particular beer style. Really the only fermentation and guidance I have for you is just try to ferment this one on the lower end of the spectrum. It, this beer is very low alcohol and therefore a lot of its flavors can really easily get lost or overpowered by yeast ester activity. So the lower you ferment your beer uh, on the you know temperature scale of that particular yeast strain that you choose, the less ester activity you'll get and therefore the less stuff getting in the way of the beer's flavor you will get as well. Uh, and then again, that's one of the reasons why I'm using a very clean yeast. Regardless though, to, to wrap things up, I'll be fermenting mine with Nottingham Ale yeast at about 65 degrees Fahrenheit for probably about one to two weeks. And then I'm actually gonna deliberately cold crash this one and let it kind of rest in and clarify naturally in the uh, fermenter itself and then flocculate out. Then I can package and keg it. And if you wanna be fun like me, I'm gonna throw it on the beer engine uh, for a little bit. We're gonna naturally carbonate the keg with some priming sugar once it's transferred and I'll put it up on the beer engine for fun. Um, if you're curious about how to make a beer engine setup work at home, I'm gonna pop a video up in the quarter. I'm not gonna explain it here, uh, but it's a really fun process and something I've really, really enjoyed. Fermentation for the beer overall went very well. It was a quick fermentation, took about four days to hit the final gravity of 1009, which is about as dry as I'm comfortable with. If it had gone any lower than that, I would not have been pleased. Uh, but Nottingham is a very dry fermenter, so this is not to be unexpected. With that fast fermentation, I let the batch sit on the yeast for another week at temperature just to clean things up. And then I actually cold crashed and let it cold crash in the fermenter for another week or so after that. I kegged the beer um, the first week of March and let it naturally carbonate uh, for use on the beer engine with some priming sugar over the next two weeks at room temperature. Once it was fully carbonated and ready, I put it up on the beer engine and I pulled a pint. So the beer is called A Wee Little Thing and it comes in at 3.7% ABV and about 31 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it's really, really fun to see it come off cask. Uh, this is actually clear for once, uh, so seeing the cascade in a clear beer is really quite pleasing as well. It is pouring a really nice, dark, rich, reddish brown color, uh, beautifully clear, catches the light in some wonderful ways. Uh, and it has a delicious looking off-white head on it that, of course, with the cask pour there is going to last for absolutely ages. I'm outside on an appropriately gray day here to finish up the tasting portion of this video uh, for this beer. So let's actually jump into aroma first. The aroma on this one is light. It's not very strong. Um, it's a very nutty kind of aroma. A little bit of like a biscuity toffee note there uh, as well, but I'm not getting all that much aroma, but that might be a function of the glass which I'm drinking out of right now, which is this uh, English dimpled mug here. This is traditionally what bitter and mild would have been consumed from back in its heyday uh, many decades ago. These are not really as popular anymore. You don't find them very frequently, but you do find the nonic pint glasses that never kind of associates with the English beer culture now, but um, this, is, this is the way it used to be. Still an imperial pint, still a uh, effective weapon in a bar fight, but uh, let's talk about mouthfeel now. Mmm, that's good. Yeah, the mouthfeel on this one 
as a function of coming off of the uh, beer engine, it is really nice. The beer engine smooths it out. You know, it knocks all that carbonation out, so you don't really get all that much uh, in terms of like a spritziness to the mouthfeel. What it does do is give a really satisfying roundness to the mouthfeel. It's really, really nice. Um, but what I am most proud of on this beer so far is the fact that I was able to get a solid mouthfeel out of this. This feels like a full-sized beer, even though it's almost, you know, it's like three and a half percent, basically. I am so happy to report that it actually has some, like, fullness to it. I think overall the mouthfeel falls under, like, the medium light category, um, but it's not light, it's not watery, it's not like, you know, many low alcohol beers are. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Overall, this beer is incredibly drinkable just as a function of that mouthfeel. Um, and it feels, again, like a bit bigger of a beer than it really is. And I'm satisfied about that. All of those little levers that I pulled to make it, you know, balanced, drinkable, dry feeling, but also still have some body to it, it all worked. And I'm really proud about that. All right, so now let's go in for flavor. <laughs> Oh, she got flavor. Ah, uh, that is awesome. Like, this is a beer style that I've been sleeping on for so long. Never made one, only had one in the wild, like, a handful of times. And this is honestly one of my favorite English beers I think I've ever made. It is so delicious. You've got that classic biscuity, nutty, like, graham cracker flavor in there but really heavy on the nuttiness. It's got a beautiful hazelnut flavor to it. Um, and a little bit of a toasted bread crust in there as well. Um, like toast, just, just toast, yeah. Mm. I mean, there's a little tiny fruitiness to it. Um, and I think that's probably a fermentation byproduct. I think it's probably a hint of acetaldehyde, actually, because I did naturally condition this beer in a keg and had a second fermentation there, which it may not have totally gotten rid of all the acetaldehyde from the natural carbonation, but that'll go away in time. Regardless, this is really nice. I mean, at 3.7%, this is so crushable. I mean, it's got so much flavor. There's a little bit of like a barley cereal character in here too, which is really satisfying. I think if I'm really looking for the hop character in this one, I'm not getting your classic EKG in terms of, you know, floralness and spiciness, but I am getting a bit of an earthy contribution, and it's a it's a hint of it. Ultimately, what this is, is balanced. It, the, the hop character is coming through to balance the sweetness and not to really come through as any sort of hop flavor. And it does a perfect job of that. It's not too bitter and it's not too sweet, and it's just perfectly satisfying. I'm gonna have to go get more. So one of the reasons why low ABV beers are so popular in the UK and surrounding areas is because that sessionability is so important. You could sit down, you can have probably five or six of these imperial pints of mild and go home and be reasonably not trashed. It's a great combination of just having so much flavor that it feels like a big beer. It's something that you can sip and savor and enjoy but not so much alcohol so that you can actually, if you wish to, drink them very quickly and many of them in a row. It, it works really nicely. This keg's not gonna last a long time. As this warms up a bit, I'm getting kind of like a little bit of a chocolatey note coming through as well. Um, it's just a multifaceted flavor that's really not what I expected. I did not expect this much complexity. And of the dark milds I've had in the past, they've all been kind of surprising in that way. And I'm really, really happy I was able to make one of my own that stands up to those. So I highly encourage you guys to make this recipe. This truly has been a very rewarding experience and it's something that I would love to do again. So once again, another big shout out to the guys over at Admiral Maltings. You guys are making some great malt and it is perfectly suited for beers like this. But yeah, when it comes down to it, in terms of potential improvements for this beer, I cannot think of any. I mean, it has the full mouthfeel that I wanted, exactly that balance that I wanted. It's got loads of flavor uh, for a 3.7% beer. I'm very impressed with the flavor. I think this is actually really quite a good beer. Definitely one of my best English beers that I've made, and I'm very, very happy with it. I think you guys should brew this beer. I really do think you should. Anyway, I think that's going to do it for me. I'm going to sit here and enjoy the rest of this uh, almost spring day and uh, finish up this delightful dark mild and looking forward to the next pint that I have after this one. This is awesome. This is what it's all about. 
If you guys enjoyed the video and you learned something, please go ahead and hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I do plenty of grand glass videos and I'm doing plenty more in the future. I'm getting to them a bit slower now that I've got a brand new kid, but I'm doing the best I can to keep up with things. I also please encourage you to comment down below. Let me know what your experience with Dark Miles has been. If you've brewed one, if you've had one in a pub, um, if this brings you back to a time that once was, let me know. I'd love to talk with you about it. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt. I have designs like this one, which are also available uh, down in my merchandise store, which is in the description box. I got plenty of other designs as well, if this one isn't quite up to your fancy. Uh, but if you want to support the channel in other ways, though, I also have a Patreon. And uh, patrons there have been really, really helpful in upgrading the production quality of this channel. I've got a couple new camera lenses over the last couple weeks that I've been working with and playing around with. So I could not be doing that without the generous support of the patrons. So you have my appreciation and thanks because it goes a long way. If you don't want to support me on Patreon, that's fine, but I also have other options that are much, much more affordable if you want something like um, channel memberships. It's a great way to support me, or the super thanks button, it's quick and easy. All of those things are awesome. Just let me know that uh, you appreciate what I'm doing, and it means a lot to me. I also have an Amazon store. If you want to check out that aforementioned channel production equipment, or you want to check out uh, some of the homebrewing equipment that's on Amazon, that's a good place to go check it out. If you want to follow me to more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those links out for some more frequent content updates, and I hope you enjoy what you see there. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, Thank you very, very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. I put a ton of work into these. It is really my passion to do this sort of thing. So I'm really glad that you're enjoying it and watching the whole thing. So this one really goes out to you. And until the next one, cheers. <laughs>